here we go. So, I think we're live. Uh, welcome everybody to this Fire Forum uh, parallel session entitled Securing Sustainable Supply Chains of Raw Materials. First of all, I'll just introduce myself. Uh, my name is Dara Boyle. I'm a consultant uh, with, an even with Evenflow, who are a space technology-based consultancy. Uh, we're, we're based in Brussels, Belgium. We've got a good uh, panel lined up for you guys here today. Unfortunately, I have to say right now, we're having a few technical issues uh, with the uh, evangelist connecting. So we may just have to uh, skip that part of the discussion and move on to the panel. And we may end up uh, finishing a little earlier than expected, but uh, we'll see how that goes. Maybe in the meantime, uh, our evangelist will be able to connect. Um, just a few things uh, up front. Uh, I'd like to do a little bit of housekeeping, just if people can keep their microphones muted when not speaking, uh, just to keep things nice and quiet for the speaker at the time, that would be great. Uh, feel free to have cameras on, it can help with the rapport. Uh, the session is being recorded, just for everybody to know. Uh, I'm going to keep, as your moderator, I'm going to try to keep the timing uh, quite strict, uh, but given that we uh, may be down an evangelist, uh, that may not be too much of an issue. Um, there will be uh, this structure of the session will be I'll introduce our sector lead. I will was planning on introducing the evangelist, but maybe that might not happen. And then afterwards, we will have a panel discussion, at which point you will be the audience will also be able to interact. We have polls and you can interact that way. You can also uh, interact using questions uh, on the set on the right hand side of the screen. So uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, our sector lead, it's Patrick Nadal. He's a senior advisor at EIT Raw Materials, and he's going to give you a short presentation. Patrick, over to you. Thank you, Dara, and thanks for having me at this uh, fantastic event. Uh, it's, it's a real honor. So yeah, I'm the first speaker in this session, and I'm, I'm trying to set the scene here. I'm not going to go into details when it comes to Earth observation applications, but I will try to make the connection between Earth observation and raw materials, as my title here suggests. So setting the scene for you. When we talk about sustainability, this really, in my opinion, starts with Europe's resource potential. But when we see illustrations like this one here, it's always a shift from the brown economy to a green and circular economy. And that's, that's fantastic. That's great. That's the way to go. But we cannot forget about you know, the input in terms of uh, raw materials, minerals and metals that are needed to drive this transformation. It's absolutely crucial. So to give you more of a background here, why raw materials are so important uh, to, to yeah, look at it from a, from a very broad perspective. Uh, this certainly is one number that we should bear in mind when we talk about why they are important because uh, the world's population is growing at an increasing speed. And by 2050, it will have uh, increased by 25%. Uh, so this number alone should uh, ring some alarm bells, obviously, in, the, in terms of uh, how much materials we need to use. Obviously, we need to get better at recycling, becoming more circular, um, but also this will have an impact on how much materials we need. Uh, here are some projections from, from the European Raw Materials Alliance uh, and uh, the International Renewable Energy Agency around um, electric vehicles, battery storage capacities, and solar voltaic capacities. And what you can see there, we're talking about orders, uh, sometimes multiple orders of magnitude of, uh, of growth over the next few decades. Uh, and this needs to be balanced out with a sustainable input of raw materials. Breaking it down to a much more personal level here. So each one of us consumes enormous amounts of raw materials. Again, we need to get better at, you know, using less, reusing more. Uh, but it's, it's clear that with these numbers uh, and considering that at this stage, approximately 30% can be uh, supplied by recycling. Those numbers obviously differ depending on what specific material, mineral, metal you're looking at. But uh, when you look at this in total, around about 30% uh, can be 
supply through recycling. So where does the other 70% come from? Uh, and this very much uh, has to come at least in the uh, short to medium term from primary raw material sources. Uh, looking a bit more in detail at those recycling or end of life recycling rates uh, for all the different elements here in the periodic table of elements, you can see that there is a large number of them uh, where recycling rates are really low uh, to the degree that simply we cannot recycle them meaningfully yet. So that's an issue that we need to solve moving forward, obviously. Giving you a few more background numbers about the status quo around raw materials. Uh, the European Commission has uh, last year published the new extended list of critical raw materials. Uh, lithium, for example, was added to that list. And we now have uh, over th 30 uh, critical raw materials in that list. And when you look at where those materials come from, you can see there is a geographic imbalance. Uh, the vast majority comes from China and other countries. And when you look at uh, European uh, country names in that pie chart there, there's only a, a, a few listed and the numbers are very low. So it's certainly um, an area of concern, uh, that dependency uh, and also obviously traceability and transparency uh, are issues around the critical raw materials supply that we have at the moment. So this leads me to the global responsibility um, and this is obviously an, an area where the Earth observation can come in as well, uh, because often, oftentimes it's not easy to monitor uh, artisanal small scale mining uh, or very remote locations. Uh, and Earth observation can certainly uh, contribute to that. And one key number here in the middle in that donut chart is um, when you look at the percentage of uh, raw materials that come from uh, different uh, politically stable or unstable or extremely unstable countries, you can see that the percentage there for uh, the supply that comes from stable countries is is uh, very low. It's 0.1% at the top there. You can hardly see that, that uh, baby blue slither there, I imagine. Uh, and those numbers are from 2020. Uh, I just checked earlier today uh, the very uh, uh, up-to-date 2021 numbers, and they're not much better. Uh, the, the percentage of fair countries or the percentage of uh, materials produced by fair, politically fair um, countries has increased, but otherwise uh, it, it's not looking that much better. So certainly an issue that we need to solve in the context of raw materials and earth observation helping with this. So taking a step back again, uh, what we're talking about here is certainly something that can be called a wicked problem. It's, it's highly complex, highly interconnected. We have many stakeholders. It has large economic impact and the information, and that's the critical point here, is often incomplete. Uh, it's not well connected, the, uh, the information, the data that we have, and sometimes even contradictory. So what we need here is a collective action. And Earth observation is a really good starting point and a really good player in this network of uh, stakeholders uh, to help to solve this wicked problem. And obviously when we talk about data, uh, we have to talk about the digital transformation and Europe and the European Commission is certainly uh, acknowledging um, that this will increasingly uh, add value uh, to our societal well-being. And Earth observation obviously uh, not just uh, collects a lot of data. It's it's one of the areas that really is, uh, when it comes to yeah, artificial intelligence. We heard that earlier this morning. And other ways how to um, manage, uh, collect, and, and and visualize data as well. Earth observation is certainly um, at the forefront. Um, when we talk about data and how much we use, I mentioned that briefly earlier. Uh, this graph here is quite impressive because when you just look at mining here from the start to the end of execution on the right there, <laughs> less than 1% of data actually makes it way to the execution level. So that's, uh, that's a worry, obviously, because we want, uh, we, we do collect a lot of data, as you can see here, but a lot of data gets lost or is not accessible. And there is that interconnectivity missing. It's not well communicated, maybe, uh, all those different things. And, and that obviously continues down the supply chain, down the value chain. 
and that's a critical issue that we need to uh, solve. So bringing the two together now, earth observation and raw materials. Uh, when we talk about those two, we have to talk about the scales of observation, starting from space, obviously, and the earth observation to regional surveys, uh, going underground, a geophysical surveys, the, the mine site, uh, more local surveys, the drill core uh, scale of, um, of uh, measuring uh, chemistry, um, then hand samples down to the millimeter and nanoscale. Uh, we really need to bring this all together. And as I said, Earth observation is not isolated. It really has to talk to all these different le uh, scales of observation. It really needs to bring in and interconnect all of that. And that's a huge challenge, but that's also a huge opportunity to really make the most of all that data uh, for the benefit of uh, the European and the worldwide economy and society. So how can Earth observation at a very fundamental level help? Uh, uh, you can see a geologist here in the field, uh, probably uh, minus 20 or something like that. Uh, and that's great. Geologists love that kind of thing. Uh, but uh, it's not as efficient as if you run a survey using Earth observation, uh, scanning large areas and getting this, this, this fundamental data that you then can use to really target it, send a team on the ground and drill uh, and really target or hone in uh, on, on a target for a deposit, for example. So that's very fundamental, uh, but there are other applications and the other uh, panel members today and speakers, hopefully the uh, evangelist can still join. Uh, I, I believe she wanted to talk about this in a bit more detail as well. There are many applications. I'm not gonna go into detail at all. Just wanted to, you to show, I wanted to show you a few examples here. So ground deformation, obviously, uh, the chemistry and mineralogy, uh, monitoring of tailing dams, uh, what's in there, the safety, all of those things, uh, aspects where Earth observation can obviously help. So it's about detecting and monitoring, and you can do that as in a really cost-effective and efficient way. And that plays into the whole social license to operate aspect. And ESG, um, obviously, I cannot uh, have a presentation on this without mentioning ESG, it's so critical and Earth observation can certainly be a puzzle piece and all that. So um, wrapping it up, what's the outlook here? When we look at exploration and mining, the raw materials sector, it's highly in interconnected. Uh, Earth observation, so the, the data we collect from space really has to connect with all the different other layers that we have down to drill core and, and, and nanoscale regional surveys. And we really need to, and we are getting better at not just collecting the data, but making the most out of it. It's really about the smart solutions and exploration and mining 4.0 and then X.0. So moving forward, uh, we, we're moving in the right direction, but there are many areas where we have huge room for improvement. To give you one summary slide here, what EIT Raw Materials uh, thinks the future of uh, mining specifically could look like. So this is sustainable mining for a modern society. Um, and earth observation, we feel plays an integral role here. That's why we decided to have that satellite there on the right as one, uh, as one aspect, one little puzzle piece in all of this, because as I said throughout my presentation here, it's really about the interconnectivity. It's about making the most of the data uh, for a more sustainable and responsible mining sector. And I will leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Patrick. That's great. Um, I'm happy to let everybody know that uh, the EO evangelist has arrived to the discussion. So uh, we, the tech people have saved the day. Um, just before I get into the introducing the EO evangelist, um, just to let everybody know, uh, on the right hand side, uh, there's a panel and you can go to interactivity. There's also a discussion where you can input questions. But on the interactivity, uh, there's a first question. There's a little bit of an error in the question. It should say uh, the raw materials industry. But we'd like to collect an idea of who's in the audience. Uh, so you can vote uh, on the, who, who you are. Are you a raw materials sector representative? Are you non-EO based? So you can vote uh, on that panel on the side. Later on, uh, we will be opening up some uh, more uh, questions uh, in the panel discussions uh, and then you can vote on those as well. 
So uh, without any further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, our EO evangelist. She was just uh, revealed to the public this morning for the first time. Uh, it is uh, Irena Benito. She is a senior product marketing manager uh, with Planet. So Irena, how are you? I uh, hope you can hear me and uh, I believe you have a presentation for us. Yeah, we can hear okay, you. Great. Sorry, cool. So, um, yeah, sorry, apologies, everyone. We had some last minute um, technical difficulties, but I'm here and I'm revealed to the world. So good morning. It's really a great pleasure to be here today and present as the first EU evangelist for the raw materials industries. Um, in my presentation, which hopefully will be brief, I'm going to provide an overview of how Earth Observation can help the sector respond to the challenges that we're facing today and also how it can help the, support the transformations that the, the, that the sector is um, undergoing. As well as I'm also going to provide an introduction with some specific examples, building on what actually uh, Patrick has just presented on what potential actually a technology has in the raw materials uh, value chain. I'm looking forward to a vibrant discussion with the audience and with the other panelists afterwards. So please don't be shy with questions. So, okay, to start with, I, I'm not, I was planning to present the challenges, but I think Patrick has done an incredible role. So in the interest of time, I'm going to actually build on, on the outline that Patrick has made about the big challenges that we're facing at the moment in Europe and actually move on to how Earth observation can really help. So the mining sector is really at a turning point in, in Europe today, but how can satellite imagery help? Starting with a quick definition refresher, what is Earth observation? Earth observation is the gathering of information about planet Earth's physical, chemical, and biological systems by remote sensing technologies, which include and involve um, normally satellites that are carrying imaging devices. This technology brings really great opportunities for the sector, which can embrace tools which have really undergone enormous improvements over the last decades and years in terms of quality, for example, there's been enormous improvement in, in the spectral, spatial, and temporal resolution of Earth observation, but also there's been a notorious fall in the prices of the technology. But how exactly can satellite technology help? It offers improved visibility, improved monitoring, objective information, and basically truth that can complement ground systems. Before I start with the enormous potential of the technology, let me first make upfront clear that all of these strengths rely on the complementarity of the data with other sources of information, especially ground truth, which is essential to validate all the results. So, okay, let's have an overview of the key strengths that Earth Observation can bring to the sector. Starting with the ability to look at large surface areas, with, which is very important in mining sites because normally they're quite large. And also it's very important if we want to look and monitor at the, the impact, for example, the environmental impact of activities, which can normally reach, of course, outside of the site and being able to monitor these surrounding areas of the site can really add credibility to the monitoring efforts of mining companies. At the same time, the resolution of the data is a great advantage. It reaches up to sub-meter resolution, and this can be essential when we're interested in observing small-scale activities. For example, when we're looking at tailings or stockpiles. Again, the richness of the data offers very high quality information, which really goes beyond pictures. So for example, the spectral bands that are offered by uh, optical imagery go all the way to hyperspectral, which is important, for example, to characterize different minerals. And also we saw that radar imagery can help, for example, monitor surface deformation. At the same time, Earth observation data can really help build trust, which is very important in the context of SLO. It is reliable. It's objective data and can, it can be used for data-driven and evidence-based decision-making, essential for social laws license to operate. Another amazing benefit is that the data is immediately in a digital format. You can also obtain the data almost in real time. There's enormous constellations that are constantly scanning the world and they provide insights in, of change as it happens. The final benefit I want to outline are the cost or operational efficiency gains that can be obtained from using Earth observation. Several relevant applications, which I'm going to be highlighting in the next slides, can, can, replace remote, um, can be replaced with remote collection systems. So if we replace field activities with Earth observation um, data, we can directly reduce the costs that are actually related to the deployment and operation of, equipment, of the equipment and teams involved in field work. Okay. So now let's look at some applications. So as I mentioned initially, I'm going to be highlighting some of the big applications that Earth Observation uh, can do along the value chain. So starting with exploration, that actually was covered already by, um, by Patrick, but I think this is a really, really important application. So you know that we need 
increasingly remote areas as demand is growing globally. And this is putting upward pressure on the costs and the risks associated with exploration campaigns. Exploration is already an area of concern for investors and definitely remote explorations are not decreasing this concern. But Earth Observation can really help support these remote exploration campaigns by helping evaluate the terrain of interest and identifying areas of high potential, which can then guide targeted field campaigns. And of course, more targeted activities can definitely help reduce the costs, especially in areas like the ones that were shown by Patrick in the, in the image, which have no transport or no energy infrastructure. Next, we have the extraction and operational phase. And of course, Earth Observation can also help here because it can really help improve the efficiency and the safety of operations. For example, in terms of environmental impact monitoring, the large area covered coverage that I mentioned before can help you monitor, again, not only the immediate mine, but also its surroundings, covering many kilometers away. And again, this can really help improve the reach of monitoring, but also the credibility in the eyes of the public. And finally, in the post mining phase, Earth Observation can also help redu reduce the costs and can offer us transparent solution to fulfill the monitoring commi commitments after the exploration period, after the exploitation period, apologies. So it can be extremely useful then, therefore, for mining companies when they're planning their operations. If you need to plan for a post-closure period, which is always uh, an issue that you have to account for, and also for public authorities for safety and environmental impact reasons after the mining has, uh, has finished. So let me give you a couple of examples in a bit more detail um, that are building on what was already presented by Patrick. So for example, environmental impact monitoring and the specific problem of acid mine drainage. What is acid mine drainage and why is it a problem? Acid mine drainage is the runoff produced when water comes in contact with exposed rocks containing sulfur bearing minerals. The reaction with water and air forms sulfuric acid and dissolved iron. And this acidic runoff dissolves heavy metals, including copper, lead, and mercury, which can pollute the ground and also pollute surface water. Why is AMD or acid mine draining, drainage a problem in mining? Tailings and mining waste generally contain sulfide minerals, which can undergo oxidation when exposed to water and oxygen and create AMD. How can Earth observation help in this particular example? By providing remote, regular, and reliable monitoring, large area visibility, and also a level of resolution that goes to the tailings or the spillage level, Earth Observation can help quickly identify and track in real time areas affected by AMD to ensure that remedial action is taken as soon as possible to reduce the impact on the environment. As you can see in the image, AMD can be identified by exploiting the diverse spectral bands offered by optical sensors. In the image, you can see the affected areas uh, which have been identified with the, as the spectral difference between the regular water pixels, which can be seen in blue, and then the AMD pixels, which can be seen in red. Like in other applications, the capacity to improve monitoring, which Earth Observation offers, can also help enormously with social license to operate, endowing mining activities and its impact on the local communities and also on the environment, with greater transparency and also helping establish task, trust between stakeholders, again going on the SLO topic. And my final example is going to be in the area of safety and stability. As you know, ground motion is one of the main hazards facing the mining industry or the mining sector. Regulation, social license to operate, and econo economic interests require strict control, control of stability in facilities, especially in tailing dams and in open pits. In the image, you can see the collapse in the tailings dam in the Brumadinho mine in Brazil, which took place in January 25th, 2019. The image shows the before and after of the event. In the image on the left, you can see uh, corresponds actually to the 24th of January, one day before the accident. And the image on the right was taken on the 29th of January on the first cloud free day after the collapse. The disaster caused more than 230 fatalities and 30 missing people, and also led to damage in the order of billions of dollars. Scientific research, however, performed after the accident showed that with radar earth observation imaging, the collapse could have been predicted weeks in advance. This is just an example of how satellite technology complementing ground-based instrumentation can help implement more robust monitoring in mining sites. But how exactly can Earth observation data help monitor stability and improve safety in mines? This example was shown actually in the image by Patrick, but let me show you a European example. Here, the Spanish, the National Research Council of Spain used Sentinel-1 data to monitor an open pit mine in called Rio Tinto in, in Spain. The project used Sentinel-1 radar data to create an early warning system that reveal and reveal the following uh, benefits of the technology. 
Firstly, using Earth observation, you can obtain measurements in difficult to access zones, such as very steep sites, which of course are normally in open pits or in dams. And you cannot place therefore in situ measurements, like for example, in clinometers. Also, you can um, uh, obtain measurements of subsidence with, resolu um, uh, with millimetric resolution. The 250 times 250 kilometer coverage of each Sentinel-1 image allows, allows monitoring subsidence, again, related to mining activities outside of the mining site in a very, very large surrounding area. And finally, the project showed that really there's enormous reliability of Earth observation data in terms of time series. The whole archive of data will be available forever. And like with in-situ measurements, like for example, GPS devices or in kilometers, that when you lose one reference point, you will lose the whole time series of data. And now the final thing I want to say, sorry, I know I'm over time, is that this mine, which is owned by Atalaya Mining, has actually implemented and taken up this earth observation-based monitoring system for their whole site, including the monitoring of their tailing dam, which is one of the largest in Europe. And also this earth observation as a monitoring tool was part of their proposal to the local authorities for the expansion of the tailing dam, which was approved in early 2021. So there's, there's this is already an, exp an example of a live application. And that's it. Thank you very much. I'm really passionate about the topic, so reach out by email or in the break. Thank you. Irene, thank you very much. We're very happy you made it to the discussion. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, presentation. The next stage uh, of this panel is that we're going to open it up uh, to some questions. I'm going to ask, introduce our panel, first of all. Also, just to explain, we're going to do it in three waves, as we call them. The first wave, uh, the trend, the theme is trends. So what are the overarching uh, mega trends in the industry that will shape the way it looks in the future? The second wave, the theme is challenges of the sector. And then the final wave is how EO can help address these challenges uh, and deal with the, trend, with the trends. Um, so I would like to, first of all, introduce uh, our panel. Unfortunately, we lost a panelist. He, he wasn't able to make it today, uh, Raphael, but we still have two great panelists uh, for you. Uh, first of all, we have Helena Maria Cavaco Viejas. She is a policy officer uh, in the Energy Intensive Industries and Raw Materials Unit at DG Grow uh, in the European Commission. Welcome, Helena. And second of all, we've, we have Mark Proctor, who is the director of Cezani, based in the UK. So I'd like to welcome uh, our panelists. Also, uh, Patrick and Irena will be jumping in for some of the answers as well uh, while we have these discussions. Uh, what I might do uh, is actually, if everyone looks on the right-hand side uh, and you go to interactivity, there are uh, wave questions. Actually, it's at the bottom is the wave one question. Uh, I can open that now. And while we're talking, the audience can vote on the poll. Um, so in terms of uh, wave one, uh, I would like to come to Helena first. Uh, I hope you're, we can still hear you, Helena. Hello, yes, thank you. Hello. Uh, so, uh, as you work in the European Commission, uh, from a policy perspective, uh, how can raw the raw materials sector help in making the vision of the EU climate neutrality by 2050 a reality? Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation to be in uh, this panel. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Dare, and uh, for the question. So um, it was uh, uh, already uh, stressed that the scene setter, how raw materials uh, are important for uh, achieving the climate uh, neutrality. Indeed, raw materials are essential inputs for the climate neutrality and also for delivering on the green and the dig digital transition. This reality is well recognized in the 2050 strategy, in the European Green Deal, in the EU industrial strategy, in the critical raw materials communication from last September. We cannot have electric cars or windmills or solar panels without raw materials. For example, now we are ramping up uh, the hydrogen technology, and this also needs raw materials. For example, fuel cells need platinum, but also other raw materials. When Patrick set the scene, presented the new list of critical raw materials, but 
I would like to say that it's not just the critical raw materials that are, are essential uh, uh, for the, the technologies which will allow us to achieve the climate neutrality. There's other essential raw materials as base metals, for example, and I can think of copper. So um, sometimes we have the idea that it that just the critical raw materials matters, but indeed uh, it's the critical raw materials, but also other raw materials. So the climate neutral economy will drive an unprecedented demand for non-energy raw materials. Achieving the climate neutrality means a shift to a more mineral intensive energy system. That can be easily uh, um, uh, explained we, if we think that a typical electric car requires six times the mineral inputs of a conventional car. And if, if we think of an offshore wind plant, it requires 13 times more mineral resources than a similarly sized gas-fired power plant. So this is why the European Commission and other policymakers uh, are very well of this reality and um, that we need uh, security and also sustainability of supply. And this is a priority in the political agendas. Uh, this topic was high uh, in the agenda of the recent G7 uh, summit, for example. And in the European Commission, we are taking action to ensure security and sustainability of supply so we can ensure that we will be able to achieve the climate neutrality at the same time as... Um, we uh, uh, deliver on the green and the, the digital transition. And actions we are taking include fostering production of primary and secondary raw materials within the EU from new mining sites, but also urban mines and reprocessing of extractive wastes and improving recycling rates. We are working on improving resource efficiency and we are also looking at uh, um, the international angle and we are developing partnerships with resource rich countries to diversify sourcing of raw materials. Just uh, 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 yesterday and the day before we had uh, the, the summit uh, with Canada uh, and we got the political endorsement of the partnership uh, on raw materials with Canada. And we are working now on a, a partnership with Ukraine. A memorandum of understanding will be signed in July. And actually, um, this partnership uh, with Ukraine has actions envisaging cooperation on Earth's observation for raw materials. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena. That was a very uh, informative answer. Uh, just a, another, a second little reminder, the, the poll is still open while we're doing all this discussion. Uh, the question of the poll is, which of the following mega trends do you see as being the most impactful in shaping the raw materials sector in the future? So once again, while we're discussing, people can uh, keep voting on the, on the poll. It's, it's actually down at the bottom, wave one. Um, so yeah, there's some, already some answers coming through. Um, a second question I have, uh, I'm going to direct it to Patrick. Um, we hear you introduced the idea of critical raw materials, and we've heard Helena uh, discussing that as well. Can you give a little overview of what exactly are we talking about when we talk about critical raw materials for some of the audience members who, who may not understand the idea? And what actions should be taken uh, to protect the supply of critical raw materials? And how can it be made less dependent on non-EU countries? Right, a very good question, and I try to keep it short. Um, uh, critical raw materials, I presented the list there. It's a long list of different elements. For example, uh, we have uh, rare earth elements on there, uh, which are not necessarily a huge sector in terms of volumes, um, but they're critical for specific applications such as uh, magnets and, and motors, permanent magnets and motors. So that's obviously a huge uh, issue when it comes to uh, 
um, having uh, wind turbines that, that are in need of, of those highly specialized products. So we need a sustainable su supply of those from, yeah, responsible mining. Now, at this stage, the mining and processing is very much focused uh, in countries that are not necessarily uh, operating with the same level of, um, you know, environmental concerns and, and politically stable conditions and so on. Um, so this is, this is of concern, obviously. But we're not just talking about mining. So lithium is one example, rare earth elements, another example, uh, platinum was mentioned uh, as well. So it's, it's a long list and all these critical raw materials, uh, what really defines them is their economic importance and the risk of uh, the supply risk. So uh, how geographically concentrated are those? How easy is it to source them? Uh, those are the two factors that kind of define the criticality list. But I want to stress here that it's not just uh, sourcing them, taking them from the ground. It's often also processing them, refining them. That's an issue. That's, that's for example, true for, for lithium. Uh, we, we have uh, in Australia uh, a lot of lithium there and it's being sourced uh, responsibly. Uh, but we have, again, a very concentrated, geographically concentrated processing of lithium to turn it into battery grade lithium and that's happening uh, in China. Um, so again, it's not just the sourcing, it's often the entire value chain we have to consider and for different elements uh, that bottleneck might be in different places of the value chain. So Europe uh, is actually going ahead and really comprehensively addressing all of that and that's a huge task, uh, but it's something that uh, Europe needs to do to become less dependent and to, to really boost uh, the European uh, economy sustainably. Well, so the idea with the critical raw materials is, I guess, the list changes, uh, maybe not on a completely regular basis, but depending on changes in the world, maybe some materials come off the list and some materials come on. So uh, how, how, every how three can, years. Every three every years. Three years. Elena, uh, Elena can probably uh, answer that better. But yeah, every three years, that list is being updated by the Commission. And uh, obviously, if things are being considered, again, the supply risk and the economic importance are the two main factors. Obviously, it's much more uh, complex, but uh, those are the main factors. Yeah. So it's a, a constant, ongoing, uh, massive task to try to ensure you have every supply chain uh, lined up so that Europe can remain uh, uh, secure in the supply? Absolutely, yeah. And uh, moving forward, that means that we cannot only look at those short-term supply shortages or risks that may occur. We really need to plan mid to long-term here, and if, especially when you talk about mining. From exploration to actually having an operating mine, you're looking at timescales of you know 10 plus years sometimes. So you really need to plan ahead. It's not that you can go, oh, we need platinum. Uh, let's just open a platinum mine and a refinery uh, and uh, next month we have the operation going. Unfortunately, it's not not the case. This takes time. Okay, very interesting. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, one one probably final question on this wave because I'm conscious of time. Um, it's something that has dictated uh, all of our lives for over a year now, and we can't have a panel without discussing the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, what do you think are the lessons that can be learned from the pandemic? Has it exposed vulnerabilities in our, in our supply chains, especially for critical raw materials? And has it exposed some weaknesses in the sector itself? Uh, I'll give that back to Helena. Great, thank you. I think I, I have. Um, so uh, we certainly uh, have lessons to learn from this uh, COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, and uh, the updated industrial strategy adopted early May makes it very clear on the main lessons learned, in particular, if we think about uh, the, the industry side. So first, the crisis highlighted the essential need to uphold the free movement of persons, goods, services and capital in the single market and the need to work together to strengthen its resistance to disruptions. Second, the COVID crisis triggered wider awareness of the need to analyze and address strategic dependencies, both technological and industrial. 
the EU and its trading partners gain resilience from world markets being open and integrated in global value chains, which help to absorb shocks and drive the recovery. And finally, uh, the crisis showed that the business case for the green and digital transition is stronger than ever. In medium uh, term, all business activity will need to become sustainable. So these are the three uh, uh, key uh, lessons uh, we got from, from the crisis. Great, thank you, Helena. Uh, I'm just going to finish off this wave with the, the fact we'll look at the, uh, the poll. Uh, the question was, which of the following mega trends do you see as being the most impactful in shaping the raw materials sector of the future? And the largest answer we've got so far is uh, population growth. So I guess people are uh, thinking that as the, the world population reaches uh, 9 billion, there's going to be all sorts of demand for all uh, the critical raw materials, but uh, people are going to need uh, cars and uh, energy, uh, windmills. So thanks to everybody who uh, answered the poll. We'll probably move on to the second uh, wave now, which is uh, to do with gaps and challenges. I'm going to direct my first question. Well, first of all, I'll open the second wave. Actually, that would make sense. So the second wave question is um, for all the people listening. What do you think is the main challenge facing the raw materials sector? Uh, that poll should be open. If not, somebody can let me know on the discussion and we'll get it, we'll get it open. So uh, on wave two gaps and challenges, I'm going to ask you, Mark. Um, you are an expert on the topic of social license to operate. Patrick and Irene both uh, mentioned it in their presentations. So can you tell our audience what exactly social license to operate, SLO, what it actually means uh, and what are the challenges faced uh, in that? Sure, sure. First of all, I have to say, I'm very glad you didn't ask me the previous two questions. They were very, very hard questions. <laughs> um, no problem. Um, but I think both, both, um, both, both Patrick and Helena basically talked about the the critical uh, problem from within the EU. So, what is social license and why is it important? For what it is. And within the EU, there is no definition for what it is. But basically, it's about the social acceptability of your uh, your business processes. So you can sometimes find it quite hard to find out that you have you know, because you can't actually so if your social license has failed, you cannot mine. So, in terms of how critical this is, sector and um, parents from young auditors um, have designated as the biggest single risk facing the main sector. Like, in the last few years, there were five years. That was a problem. That was a problem because, you know, in a pragmatic sense, if you can't mine, you can't get the materials out, but also if there's that risk, then it's very difficult to attract the in the. It, it's very difficult to attract best in a business that could be stopped at, at any particular time. So it's about predicting being able to stop happening. So, with regards to mining, one of the one of the key things that came out from the Horizon 2020 in back project, which was looking at to mining, was the fact that and spatial were critical. In fact, they were the biggest single indicator that there was going to be problems further down the line. So, from that point of view, Earth observation. I certainly has, um, but with regards to social license, I think Europe is still much playing catch up. 
point that you don't just decide, okay, we're going to let's get this going. It takes a long time. Part of the process of securing social license is to engage with the people who live there, the people who will give their consent to you to do it. And you don't get that in a year or two years. And people need strategic approaches. So there's some European companies, mining companies like Leiden and Acoba, who we work with, who are training all of their staff now on the kind of problems that um, cause social license failure. That's fun. A lot of mining companies, particularly the juniors, who don't see it as a problem because within the lifespan of the mine, they see their role as going in, exploring, locating the materials, packaging it up and flogging it on. So they're not really worried about those long-term uh, uh, processes. And that's what we had to change, I think, in some ways. So um, social place okay, can, can be destroyed or supported by mining. Um, um, and the way to promote it is and continuous engagement with communities and um, sharing values and a sustainable development approach. However, it's not solely in the gift of the mining company. The mining company by itself cannot create social license. It requires, I suppose you'd almost call it a political settlement approach. So everyone has to be on board. The state has to be on board. Those key actors have to be on board and um, so, for me, looking at the research, this the idea of mining within the EU is increasingly problematic. Communities are becoming increasingly militant. They're becoming increasingly connected to each other. I personally see that as a good thing, but it means that the approach that has been used previously of developing mines is going to have to change. So uh, we desperately need to extract these raw materials. Yet there is no EU tax, 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 taxonomy, sorry, very hard word to say, taxonomy. Mining, if you want to a uh, huge agricultural project, there are guidelines for those with it who do there are guidelines and what is good what is bad what to look out for within the mining sector so how are we expecting the in the best in a way that promotes social license and um, the technical expert group 20 said there was a need to do this but it still hasn't been done patrick has said is definitely ticking so i mean i have to say i personally passionate about mining i'm within the eu i'm very passionate again as patrick said you either accept that you're going to be importing materials that have been produced at a huge social and environmental uh, um, price, or you're going to be ransomed to people who the yeah. economy to grow as fast as it might. So it's a critical thing to do, but I also personally believe host communities should have a right to say, no, we don't want this here. Because when they get to that point and they can say no, that the processes will start to happen. Work with people to build their consent. So, and I will close now, but I think sort of um, there's a growing opposition to mining. And I think it's being characterized often incorrectly as anti-mining. I don't think it's anti-mining, but unless we engage with it, unless we talk to people, unless we look at what the issues are, then it will become that. You know, 
engineers and geologists are great at rocks and things, quantitative things, as indeed is Earth observation. But what we need to be looking at is how do we relate the Earth observation quantitative processes and things. Zazani, we developed a, a, a land change screening app a few years ago, and we're looking at how we can combine that with our social license index, which we've also been working on. We also want to use Earth observation metrics to engage with qualitative metrics to look at where the problems are, are going to be. So, um, you know, basically, I, I think it's really Did we lose Mark? Mark, are you still there? Hello? I think we... Hello, Mark. Sorry, we lost you there for a second. Sorry. Where did you lose me? I'm going to death. No, you were just... You were saying you come up with a, a new... Sorry? Yes. Yes, we had, we developed a a sort of a, a land um, type change screening up, um, which we've used in East, both in East and West Africa, as well as in Scandinavia. Any conflicts in terms of communities with with with, and we're trying to combine that with our. Um, social license tool where we have brought all of science expertise and social science expertise to, to bear. I think we we have to look at us from, from a strategic point of view and you know it may take 10 years to create a plot in the mine uh, as Sir Patrick says take 10 years to build the community capacity, consent, and their will to engage with that club. And to do that, look at how we change the business model for me. We talk enough about <laughs> No problem, Mark. Uh, well, I mean, it sounds like there's a long way to go. And given, a, it seems like it's a, quite a concern with the audience too, given the poll that we have here, what do you think is the main challenge facing the raw materials sector? The largest answer by far so far is uh, responsible sourcing and production. So so there we go. It, it reflects the strong need for uh, responsible uh, mining and attaining these social licenses to operate. Um, so another question in this uh, wave, um, and it kind of reflects a little bit back on what you were talking about, Mark. Um, as a sector which can sometimes be subject to negative public opinion, as we've just been told, uh, what can be done in order to change this and how? Uh, I'll come to you, Patrick, on this one. What do you think can be done to change the sometimes negative public opinion of, the, let's say, the mining sector? I think we can agree that it's not sometimes negative. I think it's, it's pretty devastating. That's the perception of the mining sector, uh, to be honest. Yeah, it's, it's quite... It's often framed as dirty mining, and I find it quite interesting that obviously um, many NGOs and, and, and civil society organizations are opposed to mining uh, in Europe, uh, and they call it dirty mining, uh, which is exactly what we want to solve actually by bringing uh, responsible mining, sustainable mining into Europe and, and closing down other operations that may, you know, really impact the environment negatively and also have uh, social and, uh, and other issues. Um, but it's, it's really about, um, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's so, it's, it's this complex network and I use the term wicked, wicked problems here. And it really comes down to collective action and good communication. Uh, now, this good communication 
needs to be based on a solid data. Uh, the right to say no was mentioned. Uh, I agree, but then the, the group or person making that decision needs to have access to all the information. Um, th that's, that's the critical thing here. How do we communicate this? How do we make sure? And I think it needs to start from the very beginning. Uh, the European Raw Materials Alliance, for example, is involved in an NGO engagement process. So we're really trying to actively engage and speak with NGOs. Uh, now, we didn't, to be honest, start right from the beginning. Uh, and that's, that's not great, but we're, we, the important thing is that we are engaging in this. And it should be from the start, but it's important to really communicate clearly with all stakeholders uh, Mark mentioned that as well. It's not just, you cannot just speak to one or two. You need to speak to all of them. Uh, and it takes time and, and effort. This is not, a, yeah, uh, this is not a, a sprint. This is a marathon. And it's a huge, complex uh, issue. And I pass it on to the, the, the rest of the panel. I don't want to spend too much time. Uh, Helena, do you have anything uh, to add on the question? Uh, how, can, how can the mining industry deal with the negative public opinion? Well, thank you there. Um, much was uh, uh, said already by Mark and uh, by Patrick. So this is indeed a, an extremely important issue because uh, uh, that we will have to, to deal with if we uh, really want to, to, to achieve climate neutrality. So that, there's no other way. So this is a, a really a, a key issue. And we need to do more to increase the sustainability of the sector, in particular, the environmental and social sustainability, not just in the EU, but globally. That, I would say, is the most important action to change public uh, perception. In the action plan adopted in September, we have an action that aims at promoting responsible mining practices for critical raw materials through the EU regulatory framework and also a relevant international cooperation forum. So um, this is really an issue that uh, requires to be tackled, not just at the EU level, but at global level, in particular, if we think about the vulnerability uh, um, resource uh, rich developing countries uh, will have uh, uh, in the coming years. In the EU, uh, uh, we have a robust environmental, social and governance regulatory framework in place. But we need to be able to communicate back the, better the uh, conditions the uh, extraction uh, uh, takes place. For this purpose, we just adopted the EU principles for sustainable raw materials. These principles we expect it uh, 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 to enable to better communicate with the public on the conditions uh, at which sustainable raw materials extraction and processing takes place in Europe. Uh, and with this to increase public acceptance for, uh, for this activity. It's also important that public in general becomes aware of the relevance uh, raw materials uh, uh, play uh, uh, in this green and digital transition and uh, in the climate uh, uh, neutrality we want to achieve. And um, as uh, Irene stressed very well when uh, she uh, did the presentation uh, uh, on uh, where the Earth observation uh, can help uh, with the, the raw material sector. We believe that the systematic application of Earth observation technologies and services to map and monitor mining operation safety and minimize its environmental impacts have an important role to play to facilitate uh, 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 public acceptance. Great, thank you, Helena. So I think with that, we're going to move on to the to the final wave. And the, the theme of the final wave is the opportunity for EO and how to use it. So uh, first of all, I'm going to open the, the poll question, uh, which is on wave three, or it already has been opened, sorry. Uh, where do you see EO generating the most value in the raw materials sector? So you've got some options there, exploration and mapping, permitting, environmental monitoring, operations management, and safety monitoring. And I think this question, uh, probably Irena will probably be one of the best people to, to ask this question. 
So, Irina, where do you see uh, EO generating the most value in the raw materials sector? Do you think in 10 years' time, there'll be one specific application that it's wi very widely used and maybe other specific applications in which it is not used at all? So I thank you. Um, I think that, I mean, as I tried to portray my presentation, I didn't have enough time to go through all the applications. But generally, there is very useful applications around the value, like throughout the whole value chain. I mean, remote exploration, as we're, we're talking, like mining is needed, especially to fuel the transition to like green energy and also to like meet this global demand that we're having, but also like lower down in the value chain. So uh, Patrick showed the example of like remining and reusing um, mining waste to be able to uh, assessing the mineralogy in tailings or in stockpiles that have been abandoned and that can potentially contain very useful resources, potentially also critical raw materials. I think a lot of work can be done that there with hyperspectral imagery. But what I really think and where I really see the future um, developing and where I see an enormous opportunity for everyone in the call today belonging to the EO sector is in the development of more downstream applications, solutions that are closer to the users. I think at the moment we have incredible data sources. I mean, starting from Copernicus, which offers the whole world an unmatched um, data wealth um, in with a series of sensors, again, um, optical and, and radar imagery, which is enormous. But um, the, the market may not be ready to, uh, to adopt that. Users in the, in the mining sector don't always have the technical expertise or big departments that can just take up Earth observation uh, data and make sense out of it. So I, I really encourage innovators, entrepreneurs, and researchers to put a lot of efforts on trying to develop solutions that are more tailored to the needs of users that are ready to use to work uh, higher up the pyramid and, and look at like not only data, but like the fusion of data sets, then analytic layers and really like providing insights that can be taken by mining companies or by big uh, players can also be NGOs, uh, organizations that are looking um, to represent communities and, and protect um, natural resources and, and local um, local society. But this, like, really, I think that's where we need to focus a lot of our of our efforts. The data is there. The wealth is unmatched globally, commercially and publicly. But we need to get closer to end users. That's <laughs> Great. Thanks, Irene. Um, we have another question which follows on from a little bit of what you were just saying is, what are the what do EO companies need to know? Let's say an EO company who may not know much about the sector itself. What do they need to know to fit the solutions and integrate uh, into specific business processes? Uh, maybe, Patrick, uh, do you have any insight on that? Uh, yes. Um, I mean, this follows uh, what Irena just said, really. It's, it's about connecting stakeholders. It's about connecting the data that we do have. And we do see it at EIT Raw Materials and the European Raw Materials Alliance that we get approached by, by startups, uh, small companies that have smart solutions often from the earth observation or remote sensing area but they they do not necessarily have obviously the the sector knowledge when it comes to the mining sector they may not even understand fully uh, the geology and what it is that the sector needs that the mining uh engineer and and the geologist need so it's really about that connecting those different stakeholders and i i think this this brings me to another point it's it's always important whatever data you collect um, we sometimes rely too much on data it's so important to always have that data in context and we always need people uh, with experience and and that wealth of knowledge uh, together with the data uh, and, and and often we you know more and more the the term artificial intelligence is uh, being thrown around and that's fantastic but we're still, uh, you know, this is baby steps. Uh, artificial intelligence, that's still, I think it's a great development, but, um, you know, a long way ahead of us. And it's that context, the experts, the different stakeholders, and really that interconnectivity that we need to build uh, to, to really have a synergy, you know, uh, to, I don't like using that word, but it's, it's a great word in this, in this context. This is really what it is. And just maybe to give the audience a little uh, perspective on where things currently stand, how would you describe the status of EO uh, right now in the industry? Is it widely used? Would you describe it as that? Would you describe it as barely used at all? Where is it on its trajectory and um, you know, how much further does it have to go? I'll, I'll give that back to you, Patrick, for a second. 
As Elena said, uh, it's underused at this stage. Uh, there's huge potential. Uh, it's interesting that now seven people have answered that it's the most value is in environmental monitoring, uh, which is, I think there is value, uh, but it's all along, it's for exploration, permitting, operations management, safety. Uh, I couldn't tell you which one of them is more important, uh, but it's, it's, we still need to, again, it comes down to communicating how much value there is in earth observation and bringing the two sectors really together. Uh, obviously an angle that we haven't talked about yet is the raw materials that are needed for building all this, uh, you know, uh, this equipment we use in earth observation that, that needs raw materials. So there's obviously the, the other, the other angle, the other direction, uh, should, comes full circle. Yeah, it should be considered as well, but it's, uh, and when we talk about value, there's another issue there. I, I mentioned, how much data is lost along the way, along the entire value chain. It's how do we measure this? And many of those aspects, when it comes to environmental aspects, are not fully covered yet. And so there is value in there, but we need to make sure that's being measured and being put into the equation. Uh, and, and Earth observation, I think, can really play a central role here. Great. Uh, Mark, uh, you mentioned uh, an application of using EO uh, the, uh, in yeah. Africa. Um, from your interaction with, with people, with uh, players in the sector, do you get a feeling that it's widely used? Or is it, are they well aware of it or are they not very aware of its, its uses and its value? Um, I have to say I'm speaking as a social as opposed to someone who would know anything about them. But I'm, I'm aware that my colleagues would appear to be quite switched on. I think when one looks at the... Well, it was made clear, um, companies who are working in Africa, I don't really... I mean, what we've developed incredibly sophisticated i don't think and i'm not an expert in this and um, basically just showing people land change across time being and uh, being to quantify the impact of what the mine has done in a way that they argue for a with their ladder is one thing that we've done, but I have to say, uh, and for you know, for you know, for me, the would be to get it in the hands of of middies who want to chop because I think that's ready for good confidence. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, I might come back to our EO evangelist, uh, uh, Irene. Uh, one question we have, it's a, it might be a little bit of a tricky question, but the whole idea of FIRE is to you know, help drive the, the way in which we develop uh, EO uh, in different sectors and uh, you know, to try to create a, a, a pathway uh, into the future. But if, you, if it was you that was in charge of designing um, an R&D strategy uh, involving uh, earth observation in the raw materials sector. Where would you focus your efforts? Where would you focus your money uh, in the strategy? Where do you think needs help? Great, thanks. Um, I think that the definitely like if, and I know the commission is working very hard on, on this topic and I know that the IT raw materials too, but I think definitely like where our efforts and our uh, money has to go is really in increasing the cooperations between the innovation triangle bringing together industry, research, and academia. And I would even say the quadruple helix, also bringing in social society, um, civil society to really make sure that um, the solutions that are being developed again at the beginning of the innovation chain really reflect the, the needs of users. And by these kind of collaborations that I know EIT Raw Materials and other kicks are working very hard in different sectors to really bring together um, in, in EU funded projects um, the different uh, stakeholders um, to actually find solutions that are useful. And I think that's where we need to continue. We're, we're making like enormous progress. And I think the kicks are good evidence of that over the last decade. And I think that's where we need, we need to 
work more. We want to make sure that technological developments actually have an impact um, down the down the chain and in the actual industries. And that's where I would focus. Great. I mean, Irene, we might stick with you for a little while because uh, this is more the EO focus uh, part of the of the conversation. I'm just taking a question from the audience. Maybe not everyone has seen it. It's already been asked, but. Uh, how can illegal mining of raw materials be best monitored from space when exact ground locations are not always fully known or reported? And how, how far can governments or global organizations uh, assist? So actually, I replied it, but I think it's an excellent question. Yeah. And there's a lot of research projects and research work being done on that. And I am aware of several projects, for example, happening in the Amazon region, which is an area where there is a lot of um, illegal alluvial mining, especially gold mining. And I know, for example, the UN Environmental Programme is working hard there and also um, NGOs and, and local governments, such as, for example, the government of Peru. Um, and one of the ways where Earth Observation can really help here, we're talking about, I think, a prime excellent example of how remote data can help. These are areas that are very difficult to access because they're in the middle of the Amazon or in the middle of the tropical forest. And also the activities are so small that it's very difficult to detect. So I think... Um, here, uh, projects and especially like high resolution imagery can do a lot, optical imagery, to, for example, track deforestation. So if you have sub-meter resolution, this can really help you identify um, one tree, like already the deforestation of, of one tree. And and this kind of, um, uh, of monitoring in areas that are already identified by government or by NGOs to be at risk can, can really help. In other areas, as I was actually answering in that question, where perhaps there's non there's no no trees, so other proxies have to be used for illegal deforestation. I know that many companies that are focusing on, on analytics on the back of EO data are actually providing layers to identify or detect the first sign of mining activities, for example, the construction of roads or the construction of, of buildings or small constructions that really um, show the beginning of activities in, in regions which already there, there is knowledge that there could be risk. And of course, this is relevant again in, in areas where we can't necessarily be, which is where often illegal activities happen because they're dangerous. And this is, I know the case in, in for example, some countries in Africa where actually like their illegal mining is uh, related to um, terrorist um, activities and or very remote or very difficult to access because the terrain is very, um, is very difficult. So, so yeah, those are two examples of how EO can help. Great, thank you, Irene. Um, I might actually, a question we asked Irene two questions ago, but I might give it back to Patrick. If you were to design an R&D plan for uh, EO and, and the mining sector, where do you think uh, focus should be? I think the focus should be, and I'm repeating myself here, on data and how we manage data. Um, because we still have a long way to go and developing those machine learning algorithms and uh, yeah, those, those processes leading to artificial intelligence uh, in the mid to long term, term future. I think that's, that's really important. Uh, and this can really help with examples uh, such as uh, the one that was just presented by Irena, uh, you don't even need to have a person look at those uh, images uh, that come from, from the satellite. It can be, uh, if you have a smart algorithm running through the imagery, uh, it will detect if there's a change and it can even detect, you know, uh, what kind of uh, operation it might be depending on the footprint. Um, this is true, obviously, for everything else, for the mineralogy and so on. So I think how we the best way to deal with data and then to communicate that to all stakeholders, uh, I, I, that's the key. I think that's the key for everything. And then everything else, you know, leads from there, in my opinion. So that would be the one thing that I was, would focus on. Great. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, Helena, I might ask you, um, from a policy perspective, uh, do you think that EO can deliver value uh, to the raw materials sector can it, can it deliver different types of value in the short term or uh, or in the long term? For example, in the future, may there be reporting requirements which the Commission could maybe encourage the use of uh, EO in the monitoring and reporting uh, of these uh, environmental issues? Well, certainly we recognize uh, the... the, the, the um, uh, 
added value of Earth observation based services uh, for um, the raw materials uh, uh, life cycle. Uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, th th this was already quite covered uh, over the, the the panel here. So either from exploration to uh, um, uh, the extraction phase, uh, so exploration, looking at the new deposits, uh, to the extraction phase, looking uh, at uh, how uh, uh, to achieve zero accidents, so safety issues, uh, and uh, uh, zero uh, environmental impact, looking at monitoring environmental issues, and then on the long-term uh, pause closure and rehabilitation phases. And it can be... <clears throat> Sorry, it can be extremely useful both for companies operating on the ground, but also for government entities uh, who have the responsibility to uh, monitor and supervise uh, the operations. So if we think about uh, uh, um, short term versus long term, I, I, would, I wouldn't see uh, that much uh, difference on, uh, on the possible value. It's just if we think that for the moment, uh, it's uh, uh, Earth observation services uh, is still underused uh, uh, if we think about the huge potential it offers. So we really need to uh, promote the, 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 the uptake and uh, to, to, to develop all that potential. So it is uh, widely used uh, on the uh, um, daily uh, base uh, uh, of the company operations and also of the government entities. And of course, there's also the issue on how technology and the, 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 the satellite technology and uh, how the data will be used, as Patrick also uh, expressed. So this will probably uh, um, uh, make it some difference on the, 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 the results we can achieve at short and, and long term. Uh, but the, 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 the potential is, uh, uh, is there and we believe on, on, on that potential and uh, uh, th this is why we have been working uh, to, to, to bring together on one side the, uh, um, the Earth observation community and on the other side the, the raw materials uh, community so that uh, each community can understand better and start uh, uh, um, uh, the, the links and the, uh, the potential which needs to be developed and uh, see uh, how it can be uh, implemented uh, uh, on the ground. Thank you, Helena, for that answer. Uh, very interesting. I think we've come to the end of our discussion here. Um, I'm looking at the final poll. Very interesting. Only one answer uh, stands out, and it's the question again was, where do you see EO generating the most value in the raw materials sector? And 100% of the answers are in environmental monitoring. So uh, maybe quite telling there. Uh, thanks to everybody who answered all the poll questions. Uh, we're just going to close it up now. Uh, so I'd like to thank uh, all of the panelists. Uh, we, uh, as I said earlier, we had a last minute uh, dropout. Raphael wasn't able to make it, so I'd like to thank the panelists for filling in uh, some of the answers there. Um, I'd like to thank all the audience uh, for interacting with the polls. Again, uh, you can, uh, some, uh, you may be able to still submit answers towards the end, and we can uh, collect some of the, the information on that. Um, so that's it from us. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for joining, and uh, we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye.